All right, hello, Idiots on Parade, the Too Ugly for TV podcast, bonus podcast, which is basically a vodcast. There's Barrett Antar Goodwin, bass player in Philadelphia. That's I, right. It's natural saying it. I don't know why. I don't know. Bad things happen in Philadelphia. Yeah. <laughs> I am Nathan Timmel, a uh, mouth clown in Iowa. Yeah, I live in a flyover state. Nobody knows who I am. I'm unpopular. And uh, <laughs> we, we have known each other for more years than should be legal. And we yes. talked, so if this is your first time here, uh, what we're going to talk about is he's a musician, I'm a comedian. And you said something last week. We were talking religion with uh, an atheist friends of, friend of ours. And you, you had brought up, um, do you remember what you said? I had hinted to you earlier, like I wanted to talk about this, because you can just say it again for anybody tuning in for the first time. What? Uh, no, tell me what, what was it in reference to? And I can... The cancellation of all gigs. And it really struck me because... Uh, a lot of people talk about what this does financially. They're like, oh, everything's closed. We're getting wiped out financially, which is true, and it sucks. But artistically, it, it's building. It, it, like I've, I've known that I've not enjoyed being without performing because I always have ideas in my head. That's what I do as a comedian. I'm not always on. I'm not always like pew, pew, trying to make people laugh, but I'm always having thoughts and I'm making notes and I don't have an outlet to find out whether of those, whether my thoughts are going to resonate with audiences. And I miss that. That's the whole point of why I got in doing what I do is, is to, to express what I think and hear the response of laughter. Like, yes, I'm, I'm making a connection with these people. And that is, I don't want to compare it to loss of money because money's important, but it just, it sucks on a different level. Yeah, I, I, this kind of flies in the, all right, for those of you who weren't listening ahead of time because we were off air and not recording yet, we we're just having a conversation about talent versus, not talent versus hard work, but how, how 10,000 hours of practice over a certain amount of time, whatever, leads to stuff, right? It's the Cliff Notes version. I want to say something that kind of goes against that slightly, because here's the thing. I do fundamentally believe that most things are only a certain amount of practice hours away if you have the right attention to detail, right? I kind of believe that, right? Here's the flip side of it. I say this to all my students, and I mean it genuinely. If you can do anything else, do anything else. Really, like if you can do anything else, do anything else. But I chances think, are, I got to interrupt you. Um, I, yeah. you know, because I'm I, I'm an old dog comic. I've been around forever. Yeah. And when I moved to Iowa, I met all the new kids that were uh, just starting comedy, and uh, they would ask me like, uh, "Got any advice?" And I would say, "No, you got to figure it out yourself." They they would ask me for comedy advice, and I'd say, "You have to figure it out yourself." Yeah. And if I got to know them just a little better and make friends like after a year, then the advice I gave was that was basically you, you don't want to do this if you don't have to, if, if you're doing it because you want to be yeah. rich and famous or you think it's cool, if you can do it as a hobby, do it as a hobby. And so, um, maybe 10 years later, uh, that's, that's yeah, 10 years, seven, eight, something like that. One of them had me on his podcast and said, Hey, I want to thank you you gave me the best advice I've ever gotten regarding comedy, which is don't do it. And he went on to do other things and just be happy he, because he, he got a taste. He, he dipped his toe in the behind Oz's curtain side of comedy, what you have to deal with, that it's not merit based, that you don't just um, be original and funny and get laughs and then get work. And, and he bowed out. He said, I don't have to do this. So I'm sorry to interrupt, but yeah, you just, I yeah. hadn't thought of that a year. So that's a, first goddamn thing I thought of is being thanked for telling someone do this as a hobby, get, get, get a, have a life, get a, get a, you know, do, do something that makes you happy and do comedy on the side. Yeah. I mean, here's the thing. I mean, I say that to my students and I mean it, I mean that to anybody who asks same as you, but chances are after a certain standpoint, it's just something that like, I, again, I, I don't want, I don't want to say it's just something that you are because I hate being 
boxed into a label, this defines me, right? Like being a musician, being a man, being black, being this, being that, right? I don't know that these are definitions or were they just facets of who I am as a person. But here's what I do know. I do know from the earliest age I can remember, people always say, how did you get into music? And a lot of people go, well, I heard the Beatles and I saw the Beatles on Ed Sullivan and I heard this guy. And first time I heard P-Funk or whatever, I heard this Eddie Hazel solo that made me want to play guitar. All right. Well, I don't know how I got into music because it was always there. Yeah. Like I was three years old and I was humming. And then as soon as I could whistle, I was whistling nonstop. And then you gave me a pot and a pan and a spoon and I was making rhythms. And every time we drove down the road and a car would go by and it would go, the truck would go, gah, 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 gah. Or when it drove past us, I'd hear, gah, 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 gah. And it would turn into a rhythm, like just yeah. music everywhere I looked, I saw music and everywhere I heard it in, in nature, in the car, in the rhythms of the traffic patterns. And you know what I mean? Just like, it didn't matter. Like there was no moment where it, there's, as far as I can remember, there's no moment where it wasn't, and then it was because of something that happened. It just always was. Do you know what I mean? Like, just I know exactly always. what you mean. It I can always was, you know? I, I don't, the first time I ever performed as a comedian, uh, I was four or five years old. Now, it was all stolen right. jokes because I didn't know what that was, but right. I saw comedy and I, I just, that. You know, like... Right, it just made sense. It I had all these right. ideas in my head as a kid, and I was always saying shit, but I didn't know what it was. And then I saw a comedian, and so I was, I was four or five years old at, uh, old at a summer camp, and we did a talent show, and I just... You know, I look at Truman at age six, and uh, right. I'm like, I, I, I think of myself that young, just mm -hmm. in front of the fire pit and all the campers, and I'm, take my wife, please. I couldn't tell you anything I did, <laughs> but I just... <laughs> It's Boy, what I just flew up in Milwaukee. Me. Boy, my arms tired. <laughs> exactly. Now, I want to hit you with a question. You yes, maybe we're going to go sideways here, um, because that's what we do: is we start on one topic and then we go sideways. We, we can come back to missing performing. <laughs> uh, you said you don't want anything to define you. Why? Right. The thing you made me think okay. of when I ask why is mm -hmm. is because. Um, you two in mm, 2000, 2001, 2000, when they released uh, All That You Can't Leave Behind, they were very honest about, the, I think the quote was, we are reapplying for the job of biggest band in the world because they'd done a bunch of fucking around in the 90s. They released a couple albums that weren't uh, that successful. They released uh, something called Passengers. Mm -hmm. They did a lot of fucking around. And they did a stadium tour that didn't sell out. And they went, ooh. Well, maybe instead of all this fucking around, we should just be you too. Be the best you two who we are. It's, you know, city slickers. Find that one thing. Be that thing. And look what happened in the 2000s. They shot right back up. A beautiful day. Vertigo. I mean, it was. They were as big as mm -hmm. ever. So absolutely, they just were defined by, we are you two. This is who we are. What is wrong with being hmm. defined? I guess it's not being defined, so I'm glad that you bring that up, I suppose. It's being defined in the narrow definition of what. Like, well, let me go semi-sideways. Mm -hmm. I don't know if what I do is the same thing as what I am, right? Because I will say I am a musician and I play music, but yeah, I don't know. It's tough because the original thing, the reason why we're on this topic is because I feel like the loss of gigs affects me psychologically, not just well, what you're talking about is financial, right? Like financial. Well, I said all anyone talks about is both, the finances, right, it's but. Right, but it's but it's both things, and that's how we started talking about this. The real thing is that, right, like, I didn't realize how much music was therapy for me until I couldn't do it three times a week, yeah. right? And so, and it's what I've known my whole life. 
and it's what I do and it's what I love. It's where my passion is. And it's the kind of thing that people who don't have it as a passion don't understand. Why don't you just do something else? Oh, if times are hard, go do this. And it doesn't mean I'm incapable of doing something else. It doesn't mean I wouldn't do something else. And even doing something else wouldn't, necess- wouldn't make me not be a musician, right? But that being said, I wonder if, if we include in all of the labels that we're given, right? If we say, take, take away comedian, right? Or musician or something like that. And if we say, well, I'm black and I'm male and I'm an American, right? I feel like in America, the definition of what black is is too narrow to, to confine most of the people I know. I feel that, be, that the, the label white is too narrow to define most of the white people I know. I'm getting a call about the thing. I'm, this is important. I apologize. Oh. <laughs> You're funny. <laughs> anyway, so all this will get edited out. I just interrupted you. Do you, do you remember where you were in your flow? Well, I was saying that uh, the definitions of black and white, like like for you, right? If somebody says, well, you're a white man and you're a comedian, that's too narrow a definition for who you are as a person. Do you know I mean? And, it is, yeah. but I also, fuck, how do I put this? I also don't care. If that's sure. what someone sees, I'm just like, okay, you know, it, I'm not who you think I am. Mm-hmm. But depending on how close I want to get to you, Mm-hmm. That is how hard I will work All to right. change your perception sure. of me. Yeah, that makes sense. I mean, it's one of those things where, like, I, I, I go back and forth about it, right? Like, I, I believe that there's something natural inside of me that just gravitates towards music, and it's one of those things. I also think it's a product of hard work. I also think it's not a broad enough definition to define who I am, even though it's arguably one of the most important things in my life. I go like I could argue either side of it, you know what I mean? Yeah. Right? Like that's the reality of it. It's just one of those things where like I just don't know. Do, wouldn't it be that nice to have been just really born, just don't know. Wouldn't it be nice to have been born simple minded? Well, I know so of, many people who don't know, think like this. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, they're just born a deer. You just grow up and your imprint's already there. You know what to be afraid of, right. what, to, what, what to worry about, what no, to No, they what don't know eat. what to be afraid of. Those well, motherfuckers right, well, jump in front of cars right? all the time. <laughs> oh, hey, look, I'm just going to cross the street right yeah, now. Yeah. Nothing that way, nothing that way. I'll just wait till something comes. That's how I hit a fuck. I didn't hit a deer. That fucker hit me. But, you know, I guess here's the question. In a hundred years or a thousand years, will they have evolved to the point where, like, will enough time go by with cars in their world that only the ones who are smart enough to stay away reproduce? And then those ones, it just gets printed into them, stay away from these things too. Well, I don't even know how long that takes. It might take tens of thousands of years, right? Yeah, I was going to say, because but, uh, cars have been around well, for a hundred, so. For a minute for a minute or two. Yeah. I have no idea. But, but it would be nice to be, I don't know. I mean, yeah. I don't know. I, I do know that when music is not in my life, I tend to be depressed or get into trouble or both. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? That's what tends to happen when I don't, when I don't have music as an outlet. You know, I uh, find that I'm, problems. I, I'm, I examine and I'm, 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 I'm doing, I think, and you'd have to ask others doing fairly well. I find that I'm short because I mean, it's, it's COVID, it's everything. It's, it's the guy, but I, I just, I, without my outlet, I just, I constantly feel like I'm breaking, like snapping, not breaking down, like, mm-hmm. oh, yeah, but just like, ah, you know, and I'm like, okay, inappropriate. <laughs> it's a deep breath. <laughs> right. up. It, it, this has, you know, cause it's, in, it is inappropriate. It's, it's not anyone's fault. You yeah. know, it's just my bullshit. So I have to deal with it. And I think recognizing that I'm short helps. That makes me go, okay, just, you know, walk mm-hmm. away from this because it's not important. It's just, it's a, there's a lot of shit going on, you know? Yeah. I mean, I'll say, man, I did a socially distant jam with a couple of guys. There's like a couple of cats out here have a band and they're just like looking to do some playing. And I went and played with them and it was really fun to turn up and play loud in a room with other people even if we were socially distanced and masked up you know what i mean like yeah. it was it was really fun just to crank up and play and play loud and really like run some tunes and stretch out and just kind of like just do that thing it, it 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 
it filled me up in a way that nothing else does. I mean, that's what I think that's what it is for me with music. It's like the thing that music does for me, nothing else does. Lots of things make me happy and lots of things make me feel satisfied, right? And lots of things are important to me. But most, many of those things are interchangeable. <laughs> you know what I mean? Would you phrase it that, you, you know, things make you happy and things make you... Music is fuel. It's kind of like food. Yeah. It's a necessity. It's, it's, it's yeah. mental and soulful food. It doesn't feed your stomach, but it keeps you moving forward. Yeah. Yeah, that's what it does. Right. Like, it's, it, it, it does something different. Like, yeah, it charges me up. And it charges me up to listen to it. It charges me up to learn it. It charges me up to play it, to practice it, to, you know, all of it. Like, but there is something about public performance, you know, playing in front of people and getting that, the feedback, right? Like what you talk about, the instant feedback, but it's not feedback. It's like, it's like a, a give and take right you we give them something and then they give us something else back and when it's done right it just creates a positive feedback loop you know i uh, i'm so glad you said that i have been i wrote something the other day that uh, uh, quite a few people actually found interesting which is odd usually it's uh, you know, i write something and people are like eh, let's ignore that um <laughs> Uh, I wrote about a battle of the bands that I watched and it was on a reality mm -hmm. show. So everything's filmed and the first band goes up and they're just sort of high energy and uh, rock. And I, I personally didn't find them that interesting or catchy, uh, but the audience did and they cheered and applauded and like, yeah, you guys are awesome. And when they were done and talking to the cameras, you know, what did you think you performed? The, you know, it's a reality show. Um, one guy said that, he said it was it was nice i finally feel so acknowledged and i thought that was interesting i'm like okay you were on stage there i didn't think there was anything wrong with it then the next band went up and they were just powerhouses and they just took over the show and brought down the house and won the contest and when it was over they talked to one of the guitarists and he was just sort of not distraught but he was emotionally drained and he just said you know, we just got up there and gave it all we could. We just gave it everything I had. I don't know if I can do anymore. And I'm like, wow, what an interesting twist. One guy was talking mm -hmm. about taking, like, I feel acknowledged. I was on stage. And he didn't say it like I just mm -hmm. did with the cocky, but he did sort of say, I felt acknowledged. It was good to be acknowledged. And the other guy was like, I just, we had, and, and then having heard that, I went back and watched again. And the breakdown of their performances is the second band was giving most of the time their eyes were closed and they were just in the moment and feeling and pushing the music forward and the rock band was high energy and jumping around like yeah look how cool we are and and you know i'm inventing all of this but that's what i saw subconsciously and why i did not respond to the first band mm -hmm. and just breaking down those two sentences it was nice that the audience acknowledged me versus i gave it all i could because art is giving it's it's yeah. The second guy was, the band is, we have this music. We want to give it to an audience. I have these thoughts in my head as a comedian. I want to share them with you. I'm trying to make a connection with you. You and I have talked about this, I believe. One of the first comedians I saw when I decided to do this was in Milwaukee. And I don't know anything about her. I just remember it was a female comic and she was from New York City. And she got on stage and started talking about the subway and just did not do well. And offstage, she was like, what's wrong with these people? And I'm like, well, there's no subway in Milwaukee. And you can make a subway funny anywhere, but you have to make it universal, personal to make it universal. And she was just like, isn't the subway crazy? People haven't experienced it. So I took that and went, okay, I want to be personal so that I can be universal. So that coming back around to what I already said, you make that connection with people. That's the whole point is I'm giving them part of yeah. me, talking about my life, my wife, my children, my thoughts, so that after the show, some of, some of the best conversations I ever had a, after a show was when I was talking about in vitro fertilization on stage, when Lydia could not get pregnant, when we could not naturally make a baby and the medical procedures we were going through, people came up to me after like, yeah, we went through that too. We succeeded. We went through that too. We failed. Like it's making connections. And that to me is powerful and important. Yeah. Yeah. And it's in, and it's, I feel like art has a job to a certain degree, 
And I think that that job is to give per, give people permission to feel things and express things that society tells them it's not okay to feel or express. Or you know, it allows people to think, to have thoughts in their head that they don't know how to express, expressed for them. Absolutely. That's what yeah. I get out of music that's, a lot. Right. Is, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, that's how I feel. How the hell did you write a song about how I feel? Thank you. Yeah, right. You, you, we put their feelings into words, into phrases, right? I find that a lot when I read James Baldwin. I read it and I go, God, he has the same thoughts I have. Just his are way deeper, way more articulate, and way better said. Do you yeah. know what I mean? Like well, it doesn't even have to be words. It can be a melody. Yeah. Just, just absolutely. A yeah. lick. Not, just not like some a little 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 guitar lick, although those are fine. <laughs> but just uh, the, uh, the phrasing of yeah. a guitar, the melody, where you're just like, the way that person played those notes are yeah. how I feel. How weird is that? Yeah. Yeah. I think that's what I like about a lot of the comics I like is that they 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 find the funny in the ordinary and they'll make a joke about something that i have not really thought about but when i hear the joke it makes me think about it and see how absurd something is and that always makes me laugh that like somebody saw that like like that the gift that 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 you might have is to see an ordinary where i see an ordinary situation you see something hilarious do you know what I mean? And when you show it to me, I then see what was hilarious in it. That too is a different kind of thing. Maybe sometimes it's like some deep thought I have that, that somebody will put into some kind of context for me or make me see how silly I am or whatever it is. And sometimes it's just really, I love being able to appreciate somebody else's genius. You know, like there's something really beautiful. Like I don't love sports at all, any way, shape or form. But I do love the watching the the playoff games and the 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 end the finales because I love watching people who are really good at something be good at it. Does that make sense? Right? Like just because really I don't exciting about I do love sports. I do love sports and and, and uh, not obsessed, but I'm I'm not a fan of NASCAR. However. I appreciate NASCAR drivers because I know what they're doing takes a skill I don't have. I know that there's that joke. It's like, Oh, turn left, turn left. Like, yeah, you're turning left in a 3000 pound or, or more, a two ton, 4,000, you know, vehicle at 200 miles an hour with surrounded by, I mean, I, I, I can't watch NASCAR, but I can absolutely appreciate what they do. Yeah. Yeah. I, 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 I for things I don't like because I understand right. It's different. Different is not bad or wrong or less than. Yeah. And I think that I think that this is the thing that really really took me a long time to figure out, right? And I think it's that being an artist is a really special, let's call it a gift, right? It's a special thing to have. A For gift, first. a talent, or 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 right, but what it but it doesn't entitle you to anything special other than the ability to do something, right? Like, I think I grew up in a world where I thought that having a gift or a talent or something meant that, like, that should, with that should come something, you know what I mean? And that's just not true, right? You can be gifted at something, and what that means is that really is a gift, and it's special, and it makes you a special person, and you're entitled to that gift. Or that talent. That's what that's what you're entitled. Like your entitlement is that is you are given the basic framework to be naturally predisposed to be good at something, right? Now, if you're going to put in the work and the time and the effort, then that entitles you to be good at that thing. It doesn't entitle you to anything else, right? Not even success. This, the right, right? Not success. Not money. Not fame. Not not anything. It doesn't even guarantee you happiness. It just guarantees you the true. ability to be good at this thing. And it took me a while to figure that out. That like, like when you talk about this is not a meritocracy, right? I mean, to a degree, it's a meritocracy. It's kind of like you have to be this tall to ride this ride, you know, right? Like, like you have to be good enough 
to get in the door and then good enough to stay in the door, right? But I disagree, beyond that, but really, explain. I'll explain. I'm not going to name names, obviously, but I, um, <laughs> it. I'm not going to name names, but his initials are. <laughs> I'm, I'm just going to disagree. Uh, we Bring it up next week. I'll try and find a way. I can think of a half a dozen examples, but there's no way to really say it without uh, uh, calling someone out. And I'm not here to do that. I'm not here to say, well, first of all, this person sucks and they've been doing it. But I, I, I can think of people that have just all sort right. of, I, I, yeah, they, they've just sort of Here's been I'll around, say. even though you sort of watch and go, Audience isn't really laughing, are they? And right. Yet okay. they seem to sure. fail forward, and the next thing you know, it's like he got a slot on TV. How? And you see the slot, and you're like, "That, all right, you know." And and you you can you can either get angry and bitter, like, "How do you get on TV and I'm not?" Or I, what I prefer to do is just like, "All right, you know, like." Uh, I, yeah, I, I I feel like in. And maybe any jazz musicians who watch this tell me if you disagree. I feel like in the world of jazz musicians, there are very few well-known famous people who can't play. Right? Now, that could just be my outside perspective because I'm no longer a jazz musician. But back when I was a jazz musician, I didn't know anybody who couldn't actually play, who got really good gigs, who toured with great people. I know people who got a shot. Right. who couldn't play and maybe they did one leg of a tour or one brief tour and then they were done and they never worked with those people or, or anything on that high level ever again. You know I mean, I know those, I know stories of people who got in the door but couldn't stay, but I know very few people who are working musicians who aren't good at what they do. Now, well, I think it's I different do know there. Some fans, I mean, especially I, if you're talking uh, musicians for hire because yeah. the person paying the bills isn't just gonna let anyone that right. fucks up stay on the right. On the ticket. Absolutely, but I do. I did. I this has nothing to do with anything. Uh, sorry to interrupt. I apologize. Mm -hmm. um, what's his name? H. John Benjamin, I think, the voice of Archer. Um, the, he he did an album, I guess, and I only found out about this. He he, I think, and I could be speaking completely out of term, but this is this is the article I read, and I heard a little of it. He did a jazz album because he doesn't like jazz and he thinks jazz is stupid. So he hired these great jazz musicians to come into the studio and then he just went and hit the keyboard like anything and it sounded atonal and shitty and he thought it was funny. He, he was sitting there going, see, this is what jazz sounds like. And I was listening to it going, no, that's just you being kind of an asshole because those musicians yeah. really can play and you're just pounding the keyboard trying to say, hey, this is jazz, aha. And I, I just thought, you made me think of that when you talked about jazz musicians can really play because yeah. they really can play and yeah. he couldn't and he just yeah. thought, I, and, a nothing story. I mean, but I have definitely played with artists who were less talented than their bands. Oh, you absolutely. Know? Yeah. I've definitely done that. I, I've definitely worked with some famous people who I was like, oh, their talent is not in music. They have a talent, but it's not necessarily music. It's it being might a fun be, person, it's having charisma, right, being able to be, command an right, audience. It might be a lot of things, but it's not necessarily musical. Or that's not their biggest strength. Their biggest strength is this other thing. And there's something to be said for that, right? Because I definitely have friends who believed that time was better when there were songwriters and there were performers. And the songwriters who were the best songwriters spent all their time writing songs, and the people who could deliver those songs were really good delivery mechanisms, got those songs and put them out and they sounded great. What has and, changed? Um, I think post Beatles. No. I, I don't know. What, I don't know the Beatles. No, I wrote I mean, a book like two years ago. Songwriters yeah, the, the still song, like I know. I mean but, Kelly and, Clarkson and, and, made a big deal out of it. She said, do you know the whole Kelly right. Clarkson? Yeah, we've talked about it. She, yeah. she wanted to be a song. Yeah. She, she came out of American Idol, got huge, then went through that sophomore phase of uh, like, oh, I, people don't need to write for me. I'm Kelly Clarkson. Put out a stinker of an album. Then went, oh, yeah, I need, I need people giving me hits. You know, I mean, she was not right. shy about it at all. She said, I, I will take songs from anywhere now. 
So there, there's still a yeah. huge. I, I, I mean, I'm it. not saying it's not there. What I'm saying is that I know a lot of people who don't want to do that. I've, I've worked with a lot of artists who insist upon doing their own music. They insist upon writing it. And at the end of the day, here's the thing. I like writing music too. And I write also as a form of just getting stuff out, right? Yeah. And it would, it's not that I would, and even when we play with Katie, it's not that we don't ever do covers. It's that there's something that, that she wants to say, something I want to say, something we want to say, however, right? But the... And I suppose, like at the end of the day, even when I play with artists who I don't particularly love their music, they still have a right to put it out, right? They have a yeah. right to be heard. And I don't know if it's a right, but you know, <laughs> like I appreciate the fact that they have the opportunity and that I can assist them in moving their vision forward. Whether or not I agree with their vision or not, I do think that it that it deserves a place and they deserve a chance to listen if they can find their 1000 true true fans then god bless them you know what i mean like all like, you need shit, is a niche what, you know every, i right. mean there is exactly. a market for everything right. if you can find and, it and we talked about this a couple of weeks ago like i said you know i played with a bunch of artists who had like really they have really good influences and write really shitty music right yeah, yeah. but here's the thing at the end of the day, that's just my opinion. Yeah. That's right. True. And I listen to a lot of good music too. And I also think I write pretty reasonable music, but who the fuck knows? Right. <laughs> like, right. Like at the end of the day, I'm very bad at being objective when it comes to me. Right. I don't know that I can see me as object. Like I could probably say that you could, I could have you and I could have a conversation and I could give you, chapter and verse on what you could do with your life and chances are if you follow what i said it probably would work out right but if i but i cannot look at myself and do the same thing sometimes i don't think i can but i don't to be honest i don't think but but i bet like if people just hired their good buddies like if I just hired you to come into my life and gave you a week and then to take notes and do everything. And oh, then I had gonna to do, do that. Like, you called me on this a while ago and said, Hey, I just watched yeah, the comedy set. I got some great ideas and I said, I'm in. And we never right. did it. I know, but we should do that. I was thinking about that today with your three minute set, but I think that that's it. I think that like we have to learn because we can't see ourselves objectively. We do have to learn to trust our friends which is why you have to surround yourself with people who are actually quality fucking people, right? Like people whose opinion you trust because you would, sometimes we do need their eyes. Do you know what I mean? Or their yeah. ears or their input because as much as people say, you know, know yourself, follow your own counsel and all that shit, that's all well and good. When your mind is not full of nonsense. Jim, right, like well, it's something like that, we talked that about that a long time ago. Is that I'm sane, you know? Yeah. What is that? I said it's something we talked about a long time ago. I can't remember, but I brought up uh, blind spots. We talked about where I said mm-hmm. right. I brought up this this guy's blind spots, where he was saying a lot of things, and I realized he'd been saying them for five years without acting on a single one of them. And I said that was his blind spot. I wonder what mine are because I wasn't saying it judgmentally like, man, he just keeps talking and talking. I was saying it's very interesting that he keeps saying these same, same changes he's going to make, but never does. What are my blind spots? What do I need to do that I don't do? You know, if, if I can see it in him, who can see it in me? Yeah. Who could, who could be yeah. my life coach? Yeah. And I'll, I'll, I'll say this, and I know we have to wrap up in a minute or so, not a minute, but in a few minutes. But yeah, a couple minutes. I got a, got a Zoom show, everyone. I'd promote yeah. it, but by the time I post this, it'll be over because it's tonight. But, <laughs> you're but if you're watching this, marketing. Jake and I talk about this all the time. Um, if you are watching this and you have a time machine, please go back in time, kill a baby Hitler, and then come watch my show tonight. So, you know, obviously kill Hitler yeah. first, but then come see the show. <laughs> and don't forget to rig, rig the election. Right, exactly. I, you know, toilet I was flushing. About this. Can you hear it? Someone's I flushing the now. toilet. I hope they do that during the show in a couple minutes. Coming That's to the awesome. stage, Nathan Timmel. <laughs> 
So I was talking to a friend the other day, and we were talking about blind spots. And we stumbled upon the idea of like suspending belief for the for the sake of the plot, you know? Okay. And somebody said that like when when the book you wanted to write comes face to face with the book you actually wrote, that's humility. You know what I mean? And they kind of meant like in the story of your life, right? Yeah. When you're writing the story of your life, what you wanted it to be at a certain point versus what it is that's the moment there's a reckoning there when those two things meet up you know and depending on how close you are that's how much whatever they take a power shit or something they're just non-stop <laughs> flushing right in the middle of your oh, fucking sorry. deep and interesting there you go speech on humility which i'm fascinated by but i keep getting distracted by flush flush <laughs> flush jesus goddamn well, christ I, I think one of the conclusions we came to is that we watch so many movies and so many TV shows where we're expected to suspend belief for the sake of the plot, right? Like, oh my God, here's the magic key right in the drawer, right where I needed it, exactly when I needed it. Yeah. Or the cops go, don't worry, we should go in alone and not wait for backup. It's like, really? That's not what anybody would do. Like, stop that, you know? But like, when I, but I think we've seen so much of that that we learned how to do it in our own lives. Like we learned to, for the sake of the plot that we want to be there, we learned to overlook these massive holes in the story that are like these things. And I'm not saying the TV did it to us, but there's some way, and I think it's partially because we're Americans, right? The way we are as Americans, the way our history is completely edited and from one perspective, and we've decided that's the truth, and anything else is a lie. It's like, well, it's not a lie. It's a different telling of the same story from the other person's side, right? You tell the story of the pilgrims from the Native American side, and it sounds like a bunch of terrorists came in and murdered you, and then for no reason at all, start stealing your shit. You know? back, back it up a second. Don't even go that far. You, you talked about, uh, um, just a second ago, you said the, the editing and uh, you're, you're going to, find something or this this magic moment will just happen and first thing i thought of was you know my visits to japan a a and i'm not an expert on japan by any means but just you know a, a dusting of knowledge is that their culture is based on hard work humility and honor and that there is honor and hard work and 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 mm-hmm. not magic and uh everyone deserves to be a star and dig me and thumping your chest. Like Amer- you said, it, it's an American thing. I kind of think it is. I think, I think it is an American yeah. thing. I mean, we've been raised on a kind of an American exceptionalism. And I feel like we've edited our history to make ourselves the heroes in every story that we are a part of. Every war, we're the heroes. Every, every situation, we always came in and did everything yeah. to the point where we have a hard time seeing where we're wrong you distill that down to the individual. I feel like as individuals, we have a very hard time seeing where we're wrong. And when we are wrong, we somehow take it personally. When somebody points out a way in which we have a fault, me, like I'll say for me for a very long time, if somebody would point it out, instead of thanking them for helping me see a a blind spot that I couldn't see, I would just double down and be like, fuck you, there's no blind spot. You know what I mean? You're wrong and I'm right. And it was like, that's ridiculous. Like, that's a ridiculous thing. And I, again, I come back to what we started with. You have to really surround yourself with people who you trust. Because you have to be around people who can tell you the hard truths. And even if you can't see them, you trust that they are smart and they see you objectively and they have your best interest in mind and that they may be right. Even if you end up disagreeing with them, I would say you have to at least take what they say into consideration and maybe try it out for a day or so or give it a shot just because it's like it's hard to know if something is good or bad unless you see it work. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. But a lot of times, like, like if you tell your friend, hey, man, listen, your stuff is really solid, but you need to start practicing and get your shit together and put in the effort. And they go, ah, whatever, John Lennon never took a guitar lesson. Fuck you, I don't have to take a guitar lesson, you know? Whatever, some shit like that. But unless you've ever 
like had a good teacher and then spend a few hours a day practicing every day for like a month or two and then recorded yourself and then listen to it after all the, you don't actually even know what hard work does. Like you don't actually even know that it's a real thing and a good thing unless you've done it and seen the results. So sometimes like we have to learn to trust our friends enough to just do what they suggest for just a second to see if it's, or maybe not friends, whoever it is, you know what I mean? Like, so whoever the, the person that you have elected to be your mirror, you know, to show you who you are, not the fairest and prettiest in the land, you know what I mean? But maybe with the haircut and some makeup, Parts it's possible. All. You know what I mean? <laughs> anyway, yeah. Um, what's your time like? <laughs> uh, we should wrap it up. I didn't want to interrupt you for a 700th time because I did that enough. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but when no, you talked about uh, a friend telling you what you needed to do and you doubling down, like, well, I'll show him. The first thing I thought was, of course, that's pride. Fucking with you. Fuck pride. <laughs> that's Marcellus Wallace. First thing I thought of. All right. Uh, unfortunate that this has to be truncated, but uh, yeah, man, we, we, will, we will have a better talk when yeah. everyone's in bed and not flushing toilets. And I'm not getting phone calls from panicked people who. Uh, yeah. you, should totally, you should totally leave that in. It's totally worth it. Just to leave it. <laughs> I'll watch it. It might be boring, but uh, just, oh, you, you're kind of staring funny. at me and me sitting on a phone like this. Oh, it's kind of amusing, actually. <laughs> you know? I will watch it and then decide. All right, kids. Yeah, uh, good to see Katie yeah. Henry Music dot com. Absolutely. dot com. And uh, hopefully a less hectic uh, recording next week. Yes. Yeah, man. Good to see you.